Hello everybody, Realm Builder Guy here, and welcome back to the channel. And welcome back to Crusader Kings 3 and something completely different today. Uh, something totally new for me here today. We're going to have a little bit of discussion about Crusader Kings 3, the current state and the possible future state of the game. So not my usual start guides or tutorials. No, this is more a general chat. And if you like these types of discussion videos, please don't forget to hit the like button. And this should be a discussion. I want to know your thoughts on the topic I will be discussing today, which is how to improve Crusader Kings 3. Now, we all know the Royal Court DLC is coming um, later this year, hopefully. And that will introduce new mechanics and new features and graphics and stuff like that. I'd be really curious to see how that actually taxes anybody's uh, uh, PC setup and system. But beyond that, uh, it, it adds more in-court intrigue and flavor. Um, but to me, that's not really the stuff that I'm looking for for my style of play and what I enjoy to improve the game. Now it's going to be really interesting to watch and see what it is. I like what I've seen so far in the Dev Diaries, but overall there are other areas that I believe need to be addressed to really take this game that we love, and I assume you love it, otherwise you probably aren't subscribed to this channel, uh, namely Crusader Kings 3, and how to kind of take it to the next level. So join me on this ride on how to improve Crusader Kings 3. Now, one of the areas that shouldn't be a surprise to you that I will talk about is, of course, trade. I have talked about this a lot in previous videos, be it guides or Let's Play series, that we need a trade mechanic, uh, an actual trade mechanic in the game. We need to make re trade republics more playable or playable uh, that doesn't need to be modded into the game. Just like trade routes, there is the Silk Road mod, which is absolutely fantastic, but it needs to be a generic standard part of the game. And I'm a little bit, I, not a little bit, I was very disappointed that when CK3 released that they basically used a very base version of CK2 when it came to certain features, one of which being Trade Republics and Trade. That is something that I believe should have just been in the base game of CK3 to not be able to really play as Venice in that sense, I think um, is a loss. It would have been a, an interesting mechanic to play out in this engine. So yeah, uh, what else do you need from trade? Well, what you also need from trade is the increase here in development. You know, if you could add more things to it, um, as you had, for instance, with the Silk Roads mod, where you can add trade markets, hubs, trade routes, create your own trade routes, I think would be great. Now, I don't want a mechanic like an EU4 or Imperator or Stellaris where you, or Victoria 3, which is coming, where you are building a, a society, you're playing a character in CK3. So when you're building a society or building a nation, in that sense, if that's your primary goal, then having, you know, trade mechanics like the trade nodes, the trade routes, stuff like that, um, as well as trade goods and dealing with trade goods makes perfect sense. I don't think that works with the CK3 format, but what you can do as a ruler is somehow impact trade. I think through buildings and added buildings to add more mines to the game, you know, um, not factories per se, but certain trade mechanics that you can do. I mean, you can work on it with your ports and build out your ports, but that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is building a trade hub. Here we are in, you know, Constantinople. Building a massive trade hub here would bring in a ton of money. You can control all the trade through the Black Sea here and then into the Sea of Marmara, it's strategically important and that makes it strategically important for others to try to conquer. It just adds another level to the game. So again, not no goods, but really influencing trade through buildings, development. I think technology can help you along those rides, uh, along those lines. 
The other thing is trade agreements, that you'd be able to negotiate trade agreements with other nations that help the flow of coins. Now, trade agreements brings me to the second topic that I think needs improvement in uh, CK3. Now, the second area that I think needs improvement in Crusader Kings 3 is diplomacy. To me, diplomacy is probably the weakest part of the game. Um, if we're looking at the world here, there's so many, so many nations, so many leaders, so many realms you can play, but you're so, so limited. If you watch my uh, Kingdom of Kush series, you know, there are certain limitations as far as building military alliances. That's one of the biggest ones. And to me, it needs to go beyond marriage. So just focusing in on how many kids I have, who I can marry them off to, what alliance does that bring me? It's so limited and it can be really, really frustrating, especially if you, it limits your abilities within game to maybe declare war, uh, go in somewhere and have a strategic goal. If you could build in short-term alliances as they existed in history, that rulers and realms allied that were not bonded through marriage, but rather through a common goal or a common enemy, to me, that would make a lot more sense. If you're the Byzantines here and you're looking Selchuk invasion, well, maybe you can do something with the Cumans or even the Pechenegs or Hungarians or the Fatimids simply because the Selchuks are a threat all around. Now, I understand I picked a lot of nations there that do not um, share the culture and religion, and obviously that's a big barrier at those times. But say it wouldn't. Say there would be neighboring nations that are of the same religion. Say the Pechenegs or the Cumans conquer the Pechenegs here in this scenario and invade the Byzantines from the north or invade Hungary. Well, they are a huge threat to Ruthenia, Hungary, Croatia, future Serbia here, and the Byzantines. So why, if we're not married together, it would make sense that the Hungarians, the Byzantines, the Ruthenians would ally together, even if it's just short term, maybe just for one war. And once that war ends, the alliance dissolves. But that makes sense to have short term military alliances. The next part of this is if we go to war. Now we're at war here against the Selchuk invasion. Now they are way more powerful, but if we could bring in more allies, that would be huge. And also have allies right at the start. Allies that make historical sense would be really, really important. But how we conclude wars. So if we go here, we can go to surrender and surrender and they get all of this stuff. You know, these are their, they are looking for Armenia. They are just looking for this area. But what if the war score is not at 100%? What if we change that and you don't need 100% war score because the amount of times in Let's Play series I've done, as well as private playthroughs where I've gotten to like 78% or 99% or 98% and you're so close and then like a leader dies. I mean, we had that in a subjugation war. To be able to be like, no, we're at 80% or 70% like you do in other PDX games, I'm thinking specifically compared to Rome and EU4, that you can go at 70%, let's conclude this, we're basically one, we are pushing you hard enough, we want some of the area we are after, or all of it, because we control all of it. Alternatively, to grab more, I mean, if you are at 100%, the reward there could then simply be, okay, we want this core area here, Selchuk's, oh, we're at 100% against the Byzantines, we have Armenia, but you, we've crushed you so emphatically, we actually want most of Anatolia as well. And the Byzantines are in no position to negotiate any other way, and they're able to gather that, just like an Imperator or EU4, that you have that mechanic that you can grab more land or even negotiate peace sooner if you have... The war goal, for example, uh, and all the forts within the war goal, war goal, like here, all of these sieges are done, not carpet sieging, but really all the major fortresses. Now, obviously, in Imperator Rome, you have individual fortress buildings, but what you could do here is, uh, let's pick this one here. We've got fortress level four. Maybe you need for a certain fort level as a threshold or every place that has a fort level beyond one or beyond two or something like that, that that sieges down. And yeah, you still need a carpet siege a little bit, 
but it does reduce that mechanic further. And obviously, the capital is one of the main things. Now, I get a lot of people that complain about how I conduct war in CK3, that I just bomb straight through to the capital, siege it down, and take attrition losses and kind of work my way back that way. I'm cool with that simply because I can regain those forces pretty quickly, especially if I'm, I'd say, 30-40% more powerful than, or more forces, stronger than my enemy. Uh, but the war score gain through the capital is huge. I think that mechanic's a little bit broken, to be honest. I think if somebody just wants Armenia, Armenia has a historic capital. That's the capital you need to go down and, and take down and siege down. Once you've captured that and all major cities, that should give you the full war score every single time, greater so than taking down the capital of the, com uh, the country you are going after. It, these are slight alterations, but I feel like it would make war more compelling, more interesting, and honestly, a little bit less frustrating at times when you're so close and then there's a change in leadership, but you didn't get to 100%. And that's just annoying. That's annoying. The other thing is if you have people that you've captured, part of the negotiation, if you have taken, say, the king or the queen or somebody like that importance, part of the negotiation to release them shouldn't just be cash. It should be, I've won the war. I am releasing this person. I gain 20 or 30% war score. But the way the mechanic is right now, if I release them, I lose war score. Makes no sense. Then there's no reason to let them go. But the problem is once you then have, say, a major leader, say the actual realm leader, and if you would negotiate the release before, you lose war score and you have to continue on fighting. But if you negotiate peace, they are let go out of prison and you don't get the cash. That just makes no sense. To me, that mechanic needs to be completely worked over. Um, and war is just a, a massive, massive area that, in my opinion, needs to be changed overall. And the other mechanic part of it is military alliances and how those work, but also military access. Like I talked about alliances, but military access. I should be able to negotiate, say I'm the Fatimids and I want to attack the Byzantines. Yes, I could go through the sea route. Yes, I could go through the Seljuk lands. Um, I'm not, you know, attrition can sometimes be a factor, but what if instead I can negotiate through diplomacy, a military access pact with the Selchuks so I go and it costs money and therefore you don't lose attrition because you are paying them for the goods that your army is taking so that is another area to really look at so we've talked trade we've talked diplomacy mentioned wars and how to conclude them and things to change there the third major area I want to talk about right now is Asia uh, it ends right here. Now, we know there's going to be a cultural rework in India coming with the uh, Royal Court DLC. That's great. That's fantastic. But we have all of this out here that I think needs to be added. Now, there are mods that add in Southeast Asia that add in, you know, you can do a Shogun run here with Japan and Korea. Or there's also a mod that brings in China. In my opinion, this is stuff that just needs to be added to the game. This is such a fascinating area of the world during this time, and the storylines you could build there as a player are absolutely endless. And it adds that mechanic of trade, the Silk Road, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe even tech sharing and using that as a trade mechanic technology from east to west. So adding Asia is definitely, definitely needed. I would play there a lot. Uh, I think I've mentioned a few times rebuilding the Han Dynasty is just something I would love to do. And I, you can kind of do it here, but it's not real. It's culture. It's not dynastic. And I know around this time there was no Han Dynasty. But if we add an extended timeline earlier than 867, that would definitely help uh, mitigate that a little bit and add just a little bit more flavor. Next and the final point I want to talk about are tribal mechanics. Um, in my opinion, having played as tribes now a few times, it's it's a little bit too limited in development. Now, I understand tribes 
We're technically less developed than a feudal society. I understand that. But there needs to be more in development because otherwise the only way you can really grow as a tribe is through map painting. And I know that if you look at the way, you know, Genghis Khan did it with the Mongolians, that is kind of what they did. Map painting helped their development because they just conquered more lucrative territory. But that's just an area that to me, eh, I'm not a huge map painter. So changing that a little bit, adding more buildings you can put in, more development you can put in to your nation, I think is really, really needed. I also believe that raiding isn't lucrative enough. You have to conduct so many raids to get maybe 10, 15, 20 gold pieces, head back home. I understand that mechanic is cool, but it's too limited, especially if you can't, it's hard to then raid very powerful nations and get away with it because they'll just stomp you. And the reward, in my opinion, isn't worth it. I have oftentimes decided, you know, I'm not going to raid because for 15 gold and have my military crushed, it's not worth it. If it were 50 gold or 100 gold, absolutely, I would risk it more. And I think it would add to more dynamic play as a tribe and, and add some more flavor to it. The other area of tribalism that really bothers me in the game is the path to feudalism is a bit frustrating. Now, I've played uh, as two main tribes here on the channel. One was up here, of course, in Novgorod, where, let me see if I can find the guy, we started here as Sviatopolk, which was a really fun um, save and journey to make. And he starts as tribal, but he can convert to feudalism because, well, his liege lord is feudal. So you can just take that and boom, you're feudal. And you open up so much more development technology and so on. But then down here in my series where I was playing, started Cordofan and built the kingdom of Kush, we're still a tribe, even though we're significantly more powerful than, say, that small Rurikid count and we can't switch over to feudalism we are kind of maxed on the buildings we can make we can't add more holdings uh, we can't develop more technology we're really stuck and the only way we can then advance to feudalism is we need to reorganize our faith or we need to reform our faith to an organized faith to do that I need three of the holy sites two of which I just lost right at the time where we had the piety to reform, but you also then have to metagame a little bit and not roleplay the game. You have to min-max it because you need to go down that uh, correct path for, let's see right here, for a lifestyle, if we go with learning, you then have to go down to profit to drop it by 50% because it is just exorbitant, the cost to reform the faith just to become organized so you can adopt feudal ways. That needs to be changed because the one way, super easy, totally unearned. And then this other way, in my opinion, it's just too demanding and too hard. And we became a kingdom, in my opinion, once you reach a kingdom level, adopting feudal shouldn't be free and shouldn't be easy, but it should be significantly easier than we we're still a duchy tier realm or a county tier realm. That's my opinion, and that really needs to be reworked. So there you have it. Um, four or five key areas talking about trade, diplomacy, war, Asia, and tribal mechanics that, in my opinion, need to get changed, uh, need to be improved upon to make Crusader Kings 3 an even better and an even more enjoyable game. But I'd really like to know your thoughts on the areas that I touch upon that I believe need to be improved and what you think needs to be improved in Crusader Kings 3 going forward. Hopefully some of these areas will be addressed in future expansions and patches and DLCs, but I feel like that could still be years in the future. This is kind of stuff that, honestly, for a game that's not cheap, that is well-rounded, I'd kind of like to have a lot of that in the game already. So let me know your thoughts down below. Until next time, I'm Ram Builder Guy, and I will talk to you soon.